And before we invite Mr. Bergen and Mr. Siegel out to begin our program, I do want to take one moment to acknowledge that when the sun set this evening, the Hebrew date is the 27th day of the month of Nisan. So in 1951, the Israeli government made this day the official date of Yom HaShoah. Um, some of you may know that actually that's not the full name. Right? It's uh, called Yom HaShoah uh, Vehagvura. It's the remembrance of the Holocaust and heroism. So in Israel, a siren sounded a few hours ago, and in a few hours from now, that siren will sound again. And when that happens, the country will stop. Anybody experience that? Right? The freeway stops. Right? And everybody gets up and they stand until the siren is over, and we stop to remember we stop to remember. We remember the victims and we remember survivors. We remember those who took great risk in order to save lives. And we remember the forces that, when left unchecked, allowed a brutal regime to strip the humanity of millions of people. So maybe it's Beshert, right? Maybe it's Beshert that tonight is the night that we're collaborating with the ADL. Because since 1913, their mission has been to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and free treatment to all. Today, they are the nation's premier civil rights human relations agency. They fight anti-Semitism anti in all forms of bigotry, defend democratic ideals, and protect civil rights for everyone. So I don't know. Maybe Bashir, that two years ago, you hand me a card and say, we're here. So I'd like to invite those who wish, I'm not making anyone, but anyone that would like to stand to join me in a moment of silence to remember the Holocaust and heroism, I invite you to rise at this time. Thank you. May, um, may the memory of all those that you remember personally, and all those who are remembered, may they always be a source of strength and blessing. As we move um, to our program, um, Peter, Peter Bergen doesn't need much of an introduction for many. Uh, he's been a journalist for over 30 years. In 1997, working for CNN, he produced Osama bin Laden's first TV interview and um, a terrific article that was just printed a few days ago that, that looks back at the five years since he was killed. He's the author of five books about Al-Qaeda, three of them New York Times bestsellers. The books have been translated into 20 languages have been turned into three Emmy-nominated and winning documentaries. His most recent documentary is the HBO project Homegrown, The counter Terra Dilemma, based on this book. So I know some of you have it. I saw, you, I, I, I saw that you had it, and you can purchase it this evening. They make great, what's the next thing that you're supposed to give a gift for? They make great Yoma Zikaron gifts. That's not good. They make great graduation gifts. That's a good one. Um, but he'll be signing after. So if you want to have a chance to take a picture, ask him a question, get your book signed, you should buy them um, on your way out. Um, and I hope that you will do that. Uh, he's also the vice president and director of the Fellows Program and International Security Program at New America in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're also proud that Mr. Bergen will be joined in conversation this evening with Mr. Oren Segal. He is a 14-year veteran with the ADL. He's the director of the Center on Extremism, which combats extremism, terrorism, and all forms of hate in the real world and online. He's an expert on the rad radicalization process and criminal activity associated with homegrown extremists. As such, Mr. Siegel has briefed members of Congress, is regularly interviewed by national and international media outlets and provides his expertise at conferences around the world. So without further ado, will you please help me to welcome to the Gindi Auditorium, Peter Bergen and Oren Segal.
Hi, everybody. What do you want to talk about? Um, so I was, I was speaking to Peter uh, backstage uh, earlier, and it occurred to me that I think this is, he may be the only person, I'm not sure, who has interviewed both uh, Barack Obama and Osama bin Laden, right? I don't know how many other people are there. And so I think uh, Peter, uh, you know, he's, he's you, all, you all know Peter, uh, you know, his extensive experience and expertise um, has really uh, translated into this book on what is really fundamentally uh, an important topic uh, and very topical. Uh, truth is, no matter when you speak, no matter where you speak, it's always topical, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so what I was hoping to do today is, in discussion, really have, uh, you know, Peter talk to you all uh, about some of the key themes in his book. And, and so let's just start, if that's okay. Um, you know, one of the things that I think this book really gets across is the evolution of, of, of the terror threat. Not just uh, Islamic extremism, but sort of terrorism more broadly. Um, and so there's different eras and, and different ways in which terrorism uh, has manifested itself. So let's throw a softball early on. Uh, in the last five, 10 years, what do you think the major evolution is? What are the major changes that you see as we start talking? Well, first of all, thanks for having this conversation. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you to American Jewish University for hosting this and also the ADL. Um, yeah, what are the big changes? Um, well, if we're talking about the, in this country, um, I mean, I think the big change since 9-11, let's say, is is the, the defenses. There are three big changes since 9-11, uh, because if we had this conversation in 2002, and I said to you in 2002 that 45 Americans would be killed by jihadi terrorists in this country in the next decade and a half, that would have seemed like an absurdly optimistic projection. But that's actually what has happened. And so you have to ask yourself, why? And I think there are three answers. One is our defensive capabilities, two is public knowledge, and three are offensive capabilities. So our defensive capabilities, on 9-11 there were 16 people on the no-fly list, now there are 47,000. There are a million and a half people on a much larger list called the Tide List, who if they try to get on an American plane, will be put into secondary screening. On 9-11 there was no Department of Homeland Security, it's the second largest entity in the federal government other than the Pentagon. On 9-11, the CIA and the FBI barely talked to each other. On 9-11, there was no TSA. It might be irritating to go through a TSA uh, checkpoint, but the fact is that's a big, you know, terrorists are not going to try and smuggle bombs or weapons onto a plane in this country. They're going to do something different. Uh, I mean, there's a whole other sort of, there's a long laundry list of things we've done, but I won't go through all of them. The, the next big thing is public knowledge. The fact that you're in this, we're having this discussion at all. I mean, before 9-11, people didn't consider terrorism in the United States to be a serious issue, even though, of course, right-wing terrorists had killed 168 people in Oklahoma City in uh, 1995. But it was a second-tier issue. It was the passengers on Northwest Flight 253 uh, on Christmas Day 2009 who saw that there was smoke pouring out of somebody's uh, crotch on the, on the, and who disabled them because they understood that this was a problem. It was, um, <laughs> it was uh, a street vendor in, in Times Square on May 1st, 2010 at 6 p.m. at night who knows smoke was coming out of a vehicle and who called the cops who said, look, there's something wrong with this picture. That turned out to be a bomb placed there by somebody trained by the Pakistani Taliban. And then one final point on, on this offensive capabilities. The group that attacked us on 9-11, Al-Qaeda Central, is more or less out of business. That doesn't mean that jihadi terrorism doesn't continue to exist, but we have, impo we have imposed huge costs on the group that attacked us uh, on 9-11. And we're imposing huge costs on ISIS right now. You know, ISIS has halved the salaries of its fighters. We dropped a bomb, we the United States dropped a bomb on a bank with three quarters of a billion of um, ISIS uh, cash. And the New York Post had a wonderful headline, uh, United States makes big deposit. <laughs> As a result of which, they halved the salaries of their fighters in the last two months. 
the momentum is shifting against ISIS. I mean, they've lost a lot of cities. Um, so that's the reason we're safer. I mean, the, you got, whatever your political views about President Bush or President Obama, the combination of these administrations has made our defensive capabilities very strong. Public knowledge is a huge force multiplier, and we have imposed huge costs on these organizations. So th those are all sort of um, positive projections. That, that's good news, in a sense, is what I'm hearing. And yet, this past year, um, when you look at the number of homegrown extremists, American citizens arrested for various terror-related uh, crimes, um, you know, ADL, we counted 81. Other numbers are approximately the same. You also had San Bernardino, Chattanooga, Tennessee, the, uh, in 2015, uh, Garland, Texas, the attempted shooting. So what you're saying is good news, but are we seeing that last year was a blip or of something that we should expect more of? I don't think last year was necessarily a blip. I mean, so let's kind of drill down on the examples you've given. San Bernardino, obviously, we're not far from San Bernardino here, um, where it was the most lethal act of terrorism uh, since 9-11. 14 people were killed. Now, obviously, each of those deaths are a tragedy, but it's not a national catastrophe like 9-11. It's not even like the Paris attack where 130 people were killed. And so you ask what has changed in the last several years? The last time a foreign terrorist organization tried to attack the United States was what I mentioned about the Times Square SUV. That was uh, May 1st, 2010, so that's six years ago. That was the Pakistani Taliban. Since then, no foreign terrorist organization has had any, had any kind of serious plot against the United States, which isn't to say there may not be others, but so what we're left with are people who are inspired by ISIS or other, or and they're people, they're very hard to detect because if you think the San Bernardino case, the couple were completely unknown to law enforcement. And that's actually quite unusual. When you look at these attacks, usually, if you look at the Boston attack, the older brother, the FBI did interview him. You look at uh, Major Nadal Hassan at Fort Hood, Texas, who killed 13 people. The FBI was aware that he might be a problem, but there was a dispute internally and it wasn't followed up properly. But in the San Bernardino case, they were totally unknown. And you know, unless we want to have a, um, you know, a total police state, which I don't think we do, um, where we monitor simply everybody and the, you know, who, might radic who might be radicalizing, um, we're not going to find these people. So by the, you know, what, what has changed is we're going to continue to have these lone wolf attacks, which sometimes can be pairs, a pair of brothers in Boston, a married couple in San Bernardino. They're very hard to stop. Not impossible, but that, you know, that's the bad news. The good news is there's a natural ceiling to what one person can do or two people can do. Getting weapons in this country, automatic weapons, is obviously very easy, unfortunately. So if you have these views, you can, be, you can do a certain amount of damage. But you can't kill 3,000 people in a morning if you're two people. If you think about the 9-11 attacks, 19 hijackers, they had dozens of people who were supporting them in various ways. They had money coming from, uh, money transfers from Dubai. They had a command and control kind of team in Germany. They had training camps in Afghanistan. It was a very complex attack. What we're looking at is what we saw in Fort Hood or San Bernardino, which is somebody gets an automatic weapon or several, motivated by this ideology and, you know, gets, and, and by the law of averages, this is gonna happen in the future. But it is not Al-Qaeda attacking us or, or ISIS attacking us. Not, or think about the, the Paris attack. Eight of the people in the Paris attack had been trained by ISIS and were willing to die. They'd gone to Syria. Now, you can drive from Paris to Damascus. You cannot drive from Los Angeles to Damascus. We're protected by geography, and we're also protected by volume. The number of Americans who've gone to train with ISIS is tiny compared to what the number of Europeans have done. And so, you know, it is, it is quite unlikely that we would see a Paris-style attack where you had you know, 130 people dead in this country because they just don't have the, the number of recruits required. And you know, we, don't, we don't train the US military over the internet. We train them in training camps. And so somebody who gets to Syria, goes to a training camp, you know, gets paramilitary tactics. If you think about the Charlie Hebdo attack, if you remember the pictures of those guys, they had had paramilitary training. They were, they were trained. If you don't have that kind of training, you are, you're, 
automatically going to be less lethal. Yeah. You know, it, it strikes me, so you can't drive from Los Angeles uh, to Damascus, but in some ways, you know, a lot of people who have been, uh, you know, motivated by these ideologies, you know, decided they don't have to leave their home, that they can get their ideological justification by, you know, on their phones, talking to other people who are actively trying to radicalize them. And so, you know, it makes sense that, you know, a huge attack of the scale of 9-11 or even maybe Oklahoma City bombing, it may not be as likely, um, but one-offs, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, still very much prey on the sense of security and safety of folks in this country. And so to the degree that more people are able to self-radicalize, lone wolves, whatever we call them. You know, although when I hear in the news a group of lone wolves was recently arrested, I find that troubling because it literally makes no sense. Like a lone wolf. And I understand you can have two brothers, and yeah. that's as close as lone wolf as possible. Um, but is, is somebody actually a lone wolf when the community they have online is real to them, and they're not acting alone, and they're being fed this information and being shown how to make the bombs? There is an uh, Israeli uh, counterterrorism expert called Gabriel Wyman, who I quote in the book, um, who said, the lone wolf is now part of a virtual pack. And I think that's a very good. So now, so the whole kind of concept, if you think about Ted Kaczynski, who was a Unabomber, you may recall, he mailed people bombs, he killed a couple of people, he maimed a number of people. Ted Kaczynski lived in a, in a, in a forget about the internet, he had no electricity. He lived in a tiny hut in Montana. He, and he had no connections to anybody else. And as you, as you may remember, I mean, the only reason he was found, his brother suspected that it was him. And, and, and that led to him. But, so he was a classic lone wolf. In today's world, you, in a sense, you are radicalizing with a lot of other people. And what makes this worrisome, and you mentioned the number of cases, the FBI, I talked to John Carlin, who's the assistant, he's, he's the assistant attorney general for national security. And I asked him how many cases were there this year, and he used the figure of 60. Now, that, he was focusing on ISIS cases. All of them are generated by people, what the people online. They're not going to a mosque. They're not um, going to an overseas training camp. They're radicalizing in their own bedrooms. Um, and you know, uh, Hillary Clinton said, I think, a relative, uh, kind of a smart thing. You know, we can't put up a wall to stop the internet coming into this country. You know, there's no, we can't stop that. I mean, so we are going to continue to see this. Um, that um, people will be radicalizing online. Now, I think the FBI is pretty much, you know, does a pretty good job of finding these cases, and you may could also say they do almost too good a job, because if you look at these cases in detail, typically there is an FBI informant that is inserted relatively early on. So I want, I want to ask yeah. you about that specifically, because I found uh, this part of, of your book among the more compelling, um, where you say since 9-11, the FBI has organized more jihadist terror plots in the US than any other organization. It's true. Page 97, by the way. <laughs> um, and so, you know, in terms of government and law enforcement response, um, you know, what, what do you think this says about our government and, and law enforcement? What does this mean in terms of the broader terror threat picture? You have uh, expertise in, you know, domestic terrorism, right, in terms of, uh, right, I mean, the, the FBI also inserts in, informants into right-wing extremist groups. I mean, so it's not, you know, the FBI is very concerned about right-wing extremism, as well as jihadi terrorism. And the Department of Justice is very concerned about it. So when you look at these informant-driven cases, you can have one of two reactions. You can say, this is government overkill. You know, these people are sort of being entrapped. And one of the cases I profile in the book was a paranoid schizophrenic 26-year-old who the FBI sort of persuaded to become part of. He, and he was. You know, he, he should have been in a group home getting medication. And I, I selected his case, Matthew Lanaza, because they seemed particularly egregious. Because, um, you know, he, he was sort of friendless, and somebody befriended him and sort of brought him along. Now, as a legal matter, entrapment never succeeds as a, as a defense, because the FBI is always very, care very careful to say to somebody, if you're, I'm the FBI informant, you're the person I'm. I say to you, are you really sure you want to go through with this? And you say yes. I get you to say that two or three times. As a legal matter, you cannot argue entrapment.
But I think that when we look at some of these cases, when a group of homeless men has been promised a BMW, $250,000, a holiday in Puerto Rico, if they only will kind of be part of this plot to attack some synagogues in the Bronx and bring down a, a, a US Air Force jet with a Stinger missile, which of course doesn't work. I mean, there's something that seems wrong about this. That, so that's one reaction. The other reaction is, you know, the public, you, everybody here, we have made it clear that we have zero tolerance for terrorism in this country. The FBI is not some rogue organization. It is part of the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice reports to the president through the Attorney General, and whether it's President Bush or President Obama and, or, and the Congress, we have all made it very clear that we do not want this problem to continue to the extent that we can stop it. And so neither of those reactions, I think, is wrong. <laughs> Some of these cases feel like entrapment. On the other hand, if you see somebody who is um, you know, radicalizing online, and maybe going to Washington to take pictures of the Pentagon and communicating with some terrorist overseas or somebody, you know, for the FBI not to act would be fundamentally irresponsible, and that person will go to prison for 20 years. Right. And so there's a question of, you know, how does the government and law enforcement respond? But since a lot of this radicalization, I think by uh, your account, at least 40% of the over 300 militants you surveyed or, or studied for this book had some sort of online presence. So what is the role, do you think, of, say, social media companies or the internet industry to, to mitigate the threat by potentially stopping how people are exploiting their services? What can they even do? Uh, but do they need to have more of a role? One of the great ironies is uh, social media is an American creation, yet ISIS has uh, proven to be you know, very adept in the use of social media. Now, social media companies tend to be young and Im relatively immature. Um, and they tend to have a natural hostility to being told what to do by Washington. Uh, in fact, their whole, you know, a lot of their ideological outlook is you know, the gov you know, they don't want to be told to, to do things by the government. And of course, we have the First Amendment. It's not, so we have to be very careful about how we think about these things. But I, I will say that Twitter took down 125,000 pro-ISIS accounts in the last, about two or, two or three months ago, you may recall this. And so they are acting, you know, they are, they are you know, they're American citizens and they, they want to act responsibly. And the great thing about this is we don't need legislation on this issue. All they have to do is enforce their own terms of use. The terms of use for any social media company is that you cannot incite violence on your site. And that's, you know, and the problem is, of course, there are huge numbers of pro-ISIS. You can't take them all down and they'll, they'll come back, but you can, you know. So I think Facebook was relatively early to get in to start taking down things that were not, you know, against their own terms of use. Twitter was a little bit slower, but I think they've got, they've started to become, you know, to do a pretty good job. Now, the, the train, of course, has left the station because technology never keeps up Technology always outstrips both policy and law. And so ISIS is now using something called Telegram, which is a Berlin-based social media encrypted um, platform. And, you know, obviously American laws are not, you know, you can't, I mean, they, they in a sense, this de debate has sort of moved, the facts have moved past the debate uh, because, you know, a Berlin-based social media platform you know, they, you know they, they, they're going to have German laws. Right, uh, exactly. But so, yeah, I think social media companies have responsibilities. I think they have acted quite responsibly. They, sometimes it takes a bit of time, but they understand this is a problem. Yeah. You know, I, I, I learn about new technology and new platforms basically from two places, um, from my nine-year-old daughter and from ISIS, right? Mm -hmm. they, they are the early adapters to, to this. Yeah. Um, but I will say that I just want to mention one thing about everybody as terms of services, I just feel like uh, it's important. Not, not everybody does, and it's not just sort of companies that are based in different parts of the world that you don't have, uh, you can't sort of force or, or, or try to convince to create terms of services. Uh, there is a company in the US called WordPress. Um, a lot of people host their blogs and websites on this service. Actually at ADL we uncovered a whole cache of, you know, the worst sort of ISIS videos you can imagine from the beheading ones, incitement to violence, et cetera. And we contacted WordPress to flag it, as we do at times with the worst content that we come across on other platforms. And WordPress did not remove it. 
because they didn't have specific terms of services, which I found very, I mean, surprising, right? It's surprising that there wouldn't be a company that big that had terms of services. Can you imagine if somebody who, God forbid, worked at WordPress, beheaded his coworker who worked at WordPress, filmed it with a GoPro on their head, and streamed it onto a WordPress site? They would take it down immediately, right? So the treatment of sort of ISIS propaganda by this particular company I have found to be problematic because why wouldn't you remove something that's so blatantly egregious? Um, now 125,000 Twitter accounts were removed, um, but as you've said, they really just show up in different ways. One of the things the government has been working on uh, with non-governmental organizations, private companies, is CVE, right? Countering violent extremism. Sort of become a buzzword. Or, or community resilience. Um, and, and in those efforts, what they have proposed is because you're not going to be able to remove all these, and because people will go to encrypted software or whatever, or, or platforms, is that you need to create a counter narrative. So the messages that are being delivered by ISIS are so sophisticated and compelling to younger people that we need to create. Hey, I'm here, we're in Los Angeles, right? Hollywood. Nobody tells a narrative and a story better than Hollywood, right? That we need to compete with those by doing you know, uh, narratives that say, this is not a good path to take. Do you have any evidence, or have you spoken to anybody who feels like this concept could work or has worked in any way? I mean, I think there's a distinction between counter-radicalization and counter-recruitment. And at the end of the day, for, for start, having radical views is not a crime in this country, and it shouldn't be. Um, and I think trying to stop radicalization is a little bit like trying to stop the tide. I think it, it's, I, I'm not sure how you do it. Um, what we really want to stop is people joining ISIS. So that's counter-recruitment. That is a much smaller and more doable thing. Now, how many people have joined ISIS is, a, is an interesting question because I think it, you know, I would be surprised if it's more than 60,000, probably half of whom are now dead because the war is very dangerous. Uh, in fact, New America, the nonpartisan think tank I work at, we've looked at we, we, we looked at 600 cases of Westerners joining ISIS. One of the big takeaways is half the men are dead and 7% are the women. And the women are not on the front lines because they're not allowed to do anything. Um, but you know, it shows how dangerous this war is. So that, if you think there are 1.5 billion, I'm not a mathematician, but if you do the math on 60,000 people out of 1.5 billion, that's a very, very small number. I mean, it's sort of 0, 0. 0.0005 percent or something. So we are concerned about these people joining these groups. We're not trying to trying to try and change people's minds. I mean, they've been. I've been doing this long enough that I remember the Bush administration. You may recall there was efforts to go and tell everybody around the world how great America is. Well, they're either going to believe that or they aren't. I mean, it, it's it's that's a fool's errand, I think. What we really want to do is stop people joining these groups. And how do you do that? There are three ways I think you do that. You get defectors to tell the real story. And there have been, there's been an American defector from ISIS. This poses an interesting problem for the government because by his own account, he joined ISIS, which is a crime in this country. But at the same time, he defected and he's saying all these bad things about it. He would be a very good person to come on this stage and other stages around the country and tell the real story because there's nothing more effective than a defector, in my view. The second approach is to use clerics. Now, Aaron and I were talking earlier, what relationship does this have to Islam? It has some relationship to Islam, which is both interest, I mean, if, if you accept that, the corollary of that is that there are Islamic arguments against it. And so who are the people who can make those arguments? They are clerics who actually know quite a lot about Islam. And I profile one in the book, a guy called Imam Majid, who runs this third largest mosque in the country in, in northern Virginia, near Dulles Airport. And he has personally persuaded five young men who are flirting with the idea of joining ISIS that it's against Islam. And that's much more effective than anything else. And finally, former jihadis. Can, can, there's a guy called Mubin Sheikh, who's a Canadian, who was associated with a he actually joined the Taliban, um, but he is, you know, he's a very bright guy studying for his PhD now. You know, he goes online and he has arguments with people who are flirting with the idea of joining ISIS. So, so my view on this is, look, there's nothing wrong with us creating counter-narratives or talking about it, and great. 
But I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not sure what that is going to really do. What we want us to do is to stop people joining these groups. And um, which isn't to say, you know, there's a whole, I have a colleague at New America who's a very bright PhD from Oxford, Jordanian, become an American citizen. She is mapping all the anti ISIS messages in the Arab world, much of which are done through satire. We don't even really know who these people are. And understanding who these are, people are is a good thing, and if we can help them in some way, even better. But anyway, I think there's been a lot of energy around this countering violent extremism idea, and you know, that's probably a good thing. Um, college students who've been asked to kind of come up with ideas, and that, so that, none of that is bad, but probably most of it won't, it, it does no harm. But I think the main thing is to stop people being recruited. So it seems like every day there's another case in the news, sometimes it's local, but, well, certainly when it's right-wing extremism, it's local, it tends to be when it, we're dealing with Islamic extremism, there's more national news. So some of you may have heard in Miami, um, there was an individual who, um, was uh, allegedly plotting to bomb a synagogue uh, who was inspired by ISIS. Um, and, you know, well, the issue raises a number, uh, the case raises a number of issues. I think we don't even have all the information about that case yet. But uh, why I mention it is, is, is the role of anti-Semitism. I think this audience in particular would be interested. Um, you know, we've done studies on the use of anti-Semitism in ISIS propaganda and narratives, Al-Qaeda as well, you know, all sorts of terrorist propaganda. And we see it as used actually as a tactic, you know, a way to try to get people to want to learn more about this extremist ideology. In your, in your uh, experience, I mean, what role do you see anti-Semitism, not just sort of Al-Qaeda when it was at its peak, but today as these narratives are sort of circulating online? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I was trying to, because I think that the role of anti-Semitism and this is not a scientific, or is, has receded in these groups. I mean, if you were to look at what, I, I, I've read a lot of ISIS's propaganda. They have a, they have a sort of in-flight magazine in English called Dabiq, and um, I'm really hard pressed to think about, I mean, I, I, wasn't I haven't been looking for it, but you know, their anti-Shiism, their hatred of the Shia is so intense and all-consuming that that seems the, that's the big issue for them. They often call Shias Jews, actually. Yeah, yeah. Because that's an insult. Yeah. So they have a they have a whole sort of slew of different ways they describe the Shia. So that, and yes, I mean I think these groups are anti-Semitic. There's no doubt about it. I mean, and I when I go back and think about Osama bin Laden, and certainly you know he, anti-Semitism is a very important part of his kind of worldview. But I, I think as an issue, it has receded. I don't hear a lot of stuff. I mean, I'll tell you. So if we'd gone back 10, 15 years, it would be a lot about Israel, a lot about Guantanamo. I, you just don't hear, and I mean, you're, you're looking at this as much or more than I am. I don't, do you, what do you think? Well, thank you for the question. Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, we, we see it actually quite a bit. I think at times we've sort of sensed that when ISIS maybe has experienced certain losses on the ground, mm that some of the propaganda tends to focus on Israel a little bit more. Hmm. Um, I don't know if that's to unite people, make them come across. Um, again, also not scientific. Um, yeah. You know, we haven't looked at every piece and tried to plot it out. Um, but my sense is it plays a big role. And even if you look at the American citizens uh, or, you know, U.S. born or naturalized that have been arrested for trying to join ISIS or for some plot, whether, you know, real plot or something that was just in their thoughts, I mean, you do see um, a, a proportion of them that in their online postings or et cetera talk about hatred of Israel and at times hatred of Jews. Mm -hmm. So it's not um, the predominant part of their propaganda, but it's, cer it's certainly an element. Um, yeah. I mean, I, so I go back to, um, if you go back to the kind of 9-11 Al-Qaeda, I think anti-Semitism, anti-Israel, anti there was a lot, there was a lot, of, that was a very dominant part of the rhetoric. When I look at these kids who are trying to join ISIS in this country, for them it's about joining often a utopian project uh, to be part of the caliphate. It doesn't, that, that, seems, yeah. that seems to be more their motivation. Right. 
Um, I feel like I have to ask you this, and it may be an unfair question. What do you think bin Laden would think of the way ISIS is operating today? You know, I mean, I can, t I can there actually, there are several answers I can give to that that I think are based on, you know, evidence. I mean, if you look, Al-Qaeda Central sent uh, very detailed memos to Al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2005, saying essentially, which Al-Qaeda in Iraq is ISIS by another name. Al-Qaeda in Iraq is the parent organization of ISIS. And if you look at these messages from, they were coming from Al-Qaeda's leadership, they were, stop killing Shia, we're not looking for a religious civil war, you know, exercise some restraint. I mean, we don't think of Al-Qaeda as an organization that exercises restraint. But on the issue of uh, killing Muslim civilians, and now we have a lot more evidence on this question because one of the great fruits of the bin Laden raid was not only the death of bin Laden, but we have thousands of pages of documents from his, from his compound, many, or a great number of which have been released publicly. And throughout those documents, there is a crit criticism of al-Qaeda in Iraq for its uh, tactics. So, you know, I think that the question is, um, he criticized their tactics. I don't think he was, they, their, their end game is the same. I mean, what is, what is their end game? Their end game is a Taliban-style caliphate that stretches from Indonesia to Morocco. That's what both groups, that's, that's what he wants, that's what they want. In ISIS's own propaganda, they, they, they regard themselves as the true heir of bin Laden. So I would think he would say, he'd quibble with their tactics, he wouldn't quibble with kind of the end game. And I think one of, the, one, of the book, one of the points I try and make in the book is um, about ideology. Now, ideologies have a number of things in common, whether they're secular political religions like Marxism or Nazism, or whether they're religious ideologies. And they, they say history has a purpose and it has a direction, and the direction is towards utopia. But there are these pesky people sitting in, standing in the way, and if we can just get rid of them, then we'll have utopia. And we saw this with Nazism, we saw this with Stalinism, and we see this with Bin Ladenism. So, so with Bin Ladenism, the goal is Taliban-style utopia from Indonesia Morocco. If we can get rid of the Jews, and the Israelis, and the Americans, and the Arab regimes we don't like, and the Shia, and anybody else who's in our way. And so I think that this is the real legacy of Bin Laden, is that he we killed the man, but we didn't kill his ideas. And I think killing his ideas are going to be, is going to be hard because any idea that has God as part of it is much harder to kill than something that is simply a physical entity. So when, we kill, when Hitler died, Nazism died with him. And in fact, Nazism as an ideology only lasted a very brief time compared to most ideologies, 25 years. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Marxism, there may be a couple of Marxists on some Vermont campus somewhere, but the point is, is that Marxism is basically dead. With this ideology, I thought the death of bin Laden in the Arab Spring would be the end of it. Or, you know, at least that it would, and it, you know, basically that was, you know, completely wrong. And so I think I have become much more pessimistic about this ideology and the way that it will continue for three very big reasons. The first reason is we are seeing a Shia Sunni religious civil war in the Middle East that is going to go on for decades. ISIS is not the problem. ISIS is a symptom of that problem. There will be other groups because this, this civil war is not going to... The second big problem is the failure of Arab states to govern. The, you can make a political law. The weaker a Muslim state is, the stronger ISIS will be or groups like it. So Libya, Syria, Iraq, essentially uh, Yemen, essentially failed states. You're seeing ISIS or groups like it doing well in countries which are stronger Muslim states like Pakistan, but still weak, you certainly see these groups. That's the other big factor. And finally, the other big factor, so just to finish this point, because I think this is, this is, this is talking about the future. A, a, a religious civil war that is gripping the Middle East that will go on for a long time. A c collapse of Arab, particularly Arab governance. Uh, we, we're not gonna fix either of these things any, anytime soon. And finally, the rise of European fascism combined with the vast waves of immigration from the Muslim world. And they, and they act in, in harmony with each other, in a sense, or disharmony. 
because when you have, if you look at France or you look at Poland or you look at Hungary, I mean, Hungary has a sort of essentially a fascist prime minister now. This, I think, is going to deepen. Um, and so my, I'm much more pessimistic than I would have even been five years ago because I think these are the drivers that is going to drive this thing forward. And luckily, we're, we're isolated from it here in many ways because our American Muslim population is well integrated and basically has, sim you know, which is not true in any European Muslim country. The big, the big point in the book that I make, that this is the takeaway, a takeaway I would hope you take from this evening. The Muslim population of France is 10%. The prison population of France is 70% Muslim. It's an astonishing number. This is a highly marginalized, ghettoized population. And if you look at the Charlie Hebdo attack, you look at the Paris attack in November, all of them had been to prison. So that, these are the big drivers that is gonna drive this thing forward. And I don't see any, we're not gonna create a French dream or an EU dream or a British dream. We have an American dream. These things don't happen overnight. They just, that's gonna take decades. And we're not gonna solve the Sunni Sh Shia civil religious war, which has been driven forward by the people who have the deepest pockets of the people who are pushing this forward. The Saudi government, the Iranian government. They, they're the people who could turn it off, but they're turning it up. So that, that's the depressing part. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I, if he's pessimistic, uh, you know. No, but but I, have, I have some very optimistic <laughs> messages as well, because I really do. I mean, I think we, we, in the, we, are, very, we are very lucky in a sense in this country uh, to, because we're, you know, geography protects us. The American dream has been a firewall against these ideas for the vast majority of American Muslims. Uh, we have a very effective uh, counterterrorism apparatus. And that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is if, if, if we were to say in, for shortly after 9-11, we were worried about, worried about another big attack. You know, the idea that on average three Americans would be killed every year by jihadi terrorists, that would have seemed an absurdly optimistic projection. But that's what's happened. So uh, w one last question, um, and then we'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. <clears throat> Um, you know, staggering statistic about the uh, French prison population and, you know, the, the xenophobia in general in Europe um, towards the, the, the Muslim community. So in this country, you mentioned it's not quite like that. And yet, you know, there has been, even recently, uh, a lot more of sort of this, these, these issues have entered the public discussions, shall we say. Yeah. So when you hear uh, you know, people talk about we need to not allow any Syrian refugees into this country. And people talk about it as a security concern. Whether it should or should not be a security concern, whether people are valid to have that feeling, that's what people are thinking. Um, those things that, you know, America sort of stands for, allowing people who are at risk to come in, I mean, is it more important now than ever to make sure that America sort of stands by its um, best sort of opportunities that is, is provided over the years? I mean, the answer to that surely is, of course. I mean, and, you know, we know whether it was the Japanese internment camps or um, Americans' attitude to Jewish immigration in the lead up to World War II and during our World War II that we have often not lived up to those ideals. But the fact is, is that um, the last thing I would do if I was a terrorist as posed as a Syrian refugee coming into this country, let me tell you why, because it would be very hard. Okay, so here's what I'd have to do. First of all, I would have to be a refugee. I would have to be moving from Syria into Jordan in a camp of, let's say, two million people or you know, a group of two million people. Then I'd have to be selected by the United Nations, one of 23,000 selected by the United Nations for possible immigration in the United States. Then I'd have to be part of the several thousand people of this 23,000 who are actually selected for potential immigration. Then I'd have to have two years of interviews and give up all my biometric data I mean, this would be a pretty lengthy process. Um, and why not just try and attack an American target in Jordan? After all, there's lots of American hotels. I mean, so this is not the way. And in fact, you know, I, for my book, I, my, myself and my research team looked at 330 cases of jihadi terrorism in the United States since 9-11, ranging from the trivial, relatively trivial, say, sending small amounts of money to a terrorist group in Somalia to the very serious murder or attempted murder. All the lethal attacks in the United States since 9-11 have been carried out by American citizens or American legal permanent residents. They're not carried out by immigrants, they're not carried out by refugees. There are, there are some cases of refugees 
like you know, sending small amounts of money to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. These are you know, some of the more trivial examples. So, and then, you know, then, then the idea that you know, the largest refugee movement in the, since World War II, that we're going to bring in 2,000 or 10,000, you know, it, I think it's fundamentally not how we've acted in the past. And I think it gets to this question of fear. Now, fear is obviously a very strong emotion. We, the brain that we have is the same, same brain that we had 20,000 years ago when we were living in a state of constant worry and concern about people attacking us. And so it's very easy for fear to be a forward part of our thinking. But the fact is it's fundamentally not rational. And you are 3,000 times more likely to be killed by an American with a gun going out of this, out of this uh, theater than you are to be killed by a jihadi terrorist in any given year. We should be very concerned about gun violence. The fact is we seem to just blow it off. Uh, we should be very concerned about climate change, but climate change doesn't behead people. I mean, there are other, I mean, I spend my, my professional, I, I have every interest in saying this is a huge problem. I've written five books about it. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it is a relatively trivial problem because we have, we have contained and managed it. On 9-11, we were open to an attack. We, you know, we have made it very hard. The reason we have this lone wolf problem is because it's so hard for people to get in to do an attack against us here. So I would just say, I'm this, so the optimistic part that I wanted to come to as well as the pessimistic part is we, the United States, have managed and contained this problem pretty well for all the reasons we've just discussed. By the law of averages, some terrorist somewhere is going to get one through at some point. That's, as a political matter, it's very hard for politicians to admit this fact that we've managed and contained the problem because what if something happens? And also, you don't want to say, well, by the law of averages, terrorists will get one through because that also is politically hard to say, but also true. But the fact is, is that there's going to be some other problem 10 years from now. And we're going to, everybody's familiar with the Maginot Line? Okay, we may look back on everything we've done as a big Maginot Line against a problem and then find that whatever this other problem is, is much bigger. And as Yogi, you know, Yogi Berra famously said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, but I will make a prediction that we're going to be surprised by something. It's not going to be this. But it's going to be something else. Uh, <laughs> On that note, please join me in thanking Peter for, for being here. Um, uh, how do you uh, want to take questions? Do, should we? All right, we have mics on either side. So if you want to you know, step up to the microphone, uh, we'll start on the left here, and then we'll go right, and we'll alternate for a bit. Go ahead, sir. My concern about homegrown uh, jihadism uh, deals with the universities and the uh, Muslim uh, community, American Muslim community in general. I was uh, uh, just kind of concerned about a big protest at San Diego State University where President Hirschman uh, didn't come to the uh, verbal aid of nine people uh, who were accused of at least aligning with terrorists. Uh, so the president uh, uh, was in a police car and they stopped his car from moving uh, uh, forward. I was just wondering what your thoughts or your evidence is that the, um, the community, the, the American Muslim community and uh, students uh, are uh, kind of complicit in, in this, they, do they actually take a big protest when something uh, happens, uh, such as happened okay. it in, our, in our state? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not very familiar with, uh, I, don't, I don't recall this incident, but um, you know, if we, one of the takeaways of, of, of the book, when we look at these 300 ca 330 cases, I think about a third of the cases came about because of family members or community members raising some kind of red flag. So I think in general, you know, Muslim community, um, I mean, they understand if there's a bomb that goes off that is somehow, you know, traceable to somebody in their community, it's a big problem. So 
I think that they have done overall a pretty good job of. I mean, I'll give you con I'll give you a few concrete examples. Um, a Somali American noticed that his daughter had disappeared and alerted the police to the fact that three teenage girls had tried to go and join ISIS, uh, and they were arrested at Frankfurt Airport uh, about a year ago. Um, similarly, a group of guys from Northern Virginia tried to join the Taliban. It was their family who alerted authorities. So, I mean, there are plenty of examples of uh, people in the, Muslim, in the Muslim American community raising a red flag. Um, so, you know, yeah. I, I would just leave it at that. Yeah, Mass I was, protests against... I was, just, the, I was just like to add, too, that um, I mentioned the case in, my, in uh, uh, Aventura, Florida, where somebody was allegedly going to plot to bomb the, the synagogue there. So uh, we, the Muslim community reached out to ADL to issue a joint statement condemning um, that potential plot as well. So I think a lot that is unreported or underreported is when the Muslim community does stand up um, when those issues happen, and we, we can't forget that as well. Yeah, next question. Thank you. Um, I know we're talking about domestic uh, situation, but I always try to go back to the roots of things. Um, so it's a two-part question. The Sunni and I am completely blish Shia civil war, would that have happened no matter what we did in Iraq, Syria, et cetera? So that's one part of it. The other part of it is I understand the caliphate utopian concept, but it's hard for me to imagine that people suffering under war, no matter who's causing it or creating it, are going to lash out. So we went to war with two of the secular uh, governments. Okay, in I think the we, we just want to be respectful of time. I think we got we got the two part okay. question. <laughs> Look, I mean, the original sin here is our overthrow of um, Saddam Hussein. I mean, Al-Qaeda in Iraq didn't exist in Iraq until we overthrew Saddam. Saddam, you know, was a totalitarian who objected to all forms of political, uh, any, any kind of politics other than, you know, Saddamism. So, you know, I mean, so certainly we had a role in this. And, and then we made, a form, we made the same mistake, except the Obama administration made this mistake, which was to overthrow Gaddafi, who was also an appalling dictator who was hopefully, you know, rotting in the deepest circle of hell along with Saddam. But, you know... ISIS is, you know, th this is one of the most basic political hobs writing, you know, the Leviathan after the English Civil War made a very essential point, which is the only thing worse than a dictator is anarchy and civil war. And so we seem to keep forgetting these lessons. And so we've had, we, ISIS now controls cities in Libya. So we, yes, we have had a role in this, and we do, which isn't to say that uh, I mean we're we're not the most important player in all this by any stretch of the imagination, but we have contributed to some of this, unfortunately. Not really a question, an observation. You asked about um, should we kind of promote these ideas on you know social media, or, or I'm not a filmmaker, but just sitting here listening to you recount the. The, um, pre, the imam who tried to talk people out of it, people who have defected. You have a documentary right here that if it got made with the quotes you just had and these people, I mean, we're in LA, <laughs> there's filmmakers probably in this room. It just seems from what you said tonight, you have a documentary in the making. ADL should put it together, interview these people and put it out there. So. Uh, thank you for that. You know, I, I think if we really want to impact people who are getting radicalized <clears throat> online, I think a documentary is probably going to be too long um, in some ways. And I only say this, and, and forgive me if I, uh, before the CVE uh, summit that happened at the White House, um, there were some pilot programs, one in Boston, one in Minneapolis, and one in Los Angeles. And I was involved in, here in the one in Los Angeles, and what I thought was interesting about it is uh, part of it was spending three days in a room with producers, editors of like all the movies and TV shows that we've seen, dissecting uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS propaganda, right? Because they figured if they nobody knows how to tell a story, like I said, better than Hollywood. 
So if they can understand what is compelling about this propaganda, they'll know how to do the counter narrative. And, uh, but when you get a whole, the film industry, I don't need to tell you, I'm from New York, the industry together, they want to make a movie, right? They got to make a two hour picture. Um, and that's not going to be um, necessary, necessarily the best way to influence those people. Right, now you want to talk about YouTube videos or some other types of videos? I think that's where we got it. It has to be short and sweet. And uh, so for what it's worth, but thank you for the comment. Let's take uh, two more and then I think we gotta, we gotta get out of here. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, if you could speak about the educational programs being used in Scandinavia for people who have joined ISIS or who've come back from Syria um, after joining ISIS. Uh, whether that they've been successful as they claim, whether they have application for the United States, etc. Uh, my second question is, um, by some accounts, ISIS has lost 40% of its territory in the last year. And I think it's just this week that Barron's is predicting that ISIS will be defeated within two years, um, even though they say that other, other groups will come in its place. Um, so does that not give you cause for optimism or... Um, or do you not agree with that prediction? I think that's true. I think ISIS will probably be out of business in about, a, I mean, as it, you're right. I mean, they lost 40% of their territory, I think, in Iraq and 20% in Syria just in the last year. But go back to my point about ISIS is not the problem. It's a symptom of a deeper problem. I mean, unless there'll be another group that replaces ISIS that claims to defend Sunni Islam against, you know, Shia government in Iraq, or a Shia dictator in Syria. So, I mean, until those political problems are solved, you're going to continue to have this problem. Those political problems aren't going to be solved anytime soon. We've, the Syrian civil war, in my view, has barely started. You know, there's a whole academic literature about how long civil wars last, typically from 10 to 15 years. We're in year five of the Syrian civil war. Um, and I think, it, you know, there's, it doesn't seem to be... It, the way these things end is a mutual recognition of a mutually hurting stalemate, and there's a whole academic, the, the, there is nothing, no one, there is nobody with that. So I, I don't, I think ISIS is not gonna do well over the next year or two, but that doesn't mean this thing is over. On the question of these rehabilitation programs for Denmark and Finland, they are happening. Um, I don't know how successful they are, the people coming back from ISIS sort of being deprogrammed, and could they happen in this country? I think it's very unlikely because I think there's a tendency, I mean, if people come back from ISIS and almost none have come back, they're going to be put in jail in this country. You made a very good case for our safety from terrorism uh, up to a point here in the United States. I'm going to Berlin in a couple of weeks. Should I be nervous? I mean, why? <laughs> I mean, the lot, there's, I mean, I, look, I think this is, I mean, you shouldn't be nervous going to Paris. I mean, the, the statistical likelihood of you being killed in a terrorist attack if you went to Paris as an American tourist is infinitesimally small. It is higher than if you just are in LA. But it's still, you know, you're much more likely to be killed by a, you know, by a French driver who, you know, knocks into you or, or any other thing. So, so I would not worry about going to Berlin. All right, one more. <laughs> In the Atlantic Monthly article, What Does ISIS Want?, the author made the point that w once the caliphate was declared, all Muslims are supposed to show up in the caliphate and there's not supposed to be any government. My question to you is, how are the homegrown terrorists staying home causing trouble if the mandate is to get up and go to Iraq? Well, I think a lot of them are trying to do that. I mean, they, um, some of the people I profile in the book are of these idealistic kids who somehow filter out ISIS's brutality and think that there is this caliphate and they get arrested at O'Hare Airport or they get arrested at Denver Airport. I mean, they are trying to go. They're trying to join this, you know, utopian project. And, and I think in the 70s, they would have joined the white, you know, the Weather Underground or the Black Panthers or some other, you know, people want to belong to something and, and people want to belong to something exciting. And this is, you know, we, we, we see the beheading videos, which of course is much of what ISIS is doing. But for the people who are joining, they, they see this as exciting and, and utopian. And just to make a point, in the Iraq conflict, pardon me, between Sunni and Shia, there was a six-year war that started over phosphorus mines, and that was back when the Shah was in power. That Sunni-Shia conflict is older than 
most of us in this room, certainly. Well, no, I mean, it goes back to the seventh century, so I mean, it's been around for a while. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. We really appreciate it.